behalf of the University of Iowa Anti-War Committee, People for Justice in Palestine, we'd like to welcome you all to tonight's very special program, Palestine Now, an eyewitness account by Joe Goodner. Tonight's speaker, Joe Goodner, is a native of Iowa City and a recent graduate of the University of Iowa School of Law. Um, he's spent some time uh, traveling lately. He's been in Greece um, and has a lot to say about the events over there that we heard about uh, last winter and spring, I believe it was. Uh, but most recently, he's been in uh, Palestine with the International Solidarity Movement, which is a grassroots movement of human rights activists who are calling attention to the abuse of Palestinian human rights in the occupied territory and the impunity which is enjoyed by Israeli soldiers and government officials because of our government and other Western governments. Uh, Rachel Corey, who was killed by an Israeli bulldozer in March of 2003, was a member of ISM. And there are other people who have also died nonviolently uh, protesting the illegal Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory. Uh, Joe has been, uh, he was in Palestine from June 9th approximately to July 14th. He was in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, Nablus, and Nilin and Bilin areas, which are outside Ramallah, among other places. Uh, please uh, give us a special uh, Iowa City welcome for Joe Goodner. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for coming. Can the, everybody hear me? Okay. I guess I have to talk into the microphone for the TV. Um, so I was in Palestine between, uh, well, for five weeks in June and July, basically. And um, uh, I'm just here to, to tell you about what I saw there. Um, I'm not really here to try to give like a general lecture or a general background on like the history of the conflict with Israel and Palestine. Um, or to get into some giant debate about that. Um, but, but more specifically, I'm here to tell you what I, what I happened to see in the five weeks that I was there. Um, I was there with International Solidarity Movement, um, uh, which is a nonviolent Palestinian-led organization that's committed to ending the, the uh, military occupation of Palestine. Um, in addition to Rachel Corey, the most recent member they've had uh, uh, severely injured was Tristan Anderson, who you might have heard was shot in the face with a high-velocity high velocity tear gas round um, in uh, March of this year, I believe, and he's pretty much a vegetable now after that. Um, anyways, I'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, this is just a... This is a map. It's called a shrinking map of Palestine. It, I'm not sure how well you can see it. I had to kind of enlarge it, so I hope it didn't get stretch too much. Um, starting in 1947, I think uh, the, the future uh, citizens of Israel maybe owned 7% of Palestine. Um, there was an agreement after the Second World War to create the State of Israel uh, in which the State of Israel was given uh, what was approximately 55% of Palestine. And that's the second picture. There was a war right away in 1948 between uh, a group of Arab armies, uh, very unorganized armies, uh, poorly trained and poorly equipped armies. They were, they were easily defeated by Israel, um, in which Israel took a whole bunch more property. Um, that's when you can see going from the, uh, the second to the third picture, uh, most of the West Bank all the way up until the point of Jerusalem was taken, uh, the Gaza Strip was, was cut way down. was all taken, and uh, that was what Israel controlled effectively until 1967 when there was another large war. Um, during the, uh, the large war in 1967, more territory was taken, and since 1967, we have a progression of the last picture, which goes until 2005, um, and that's what remains Palestinian. Um, you can see 
the general shape of the West Bank remains, and at least the part of Gaza that was on the seacoast remains, although because of Egypt cooperating with Israel, there's a military blockade of Gaza, the seaport's fairly worthless. Um, and the rest of the West Bank, between uh, illegal settlements, um, between the wall, between roads that only settlers are allowed to use, uh, has been carved up into all these pieces that, uh, you know, there's not a, not a lot left. Many of these, the majority of Palestinians that I met, and again, as I said at the beginning, uh, the point of this talk is, is uh, to say what I saw while I was in Palestine and just to give you my firsthand experience. And it was my firsthand observation that most Palestinians are farmers. And most of the West Bank is, is fairly fertile farmland. Um, you can see when so much territory disappears, uh, it's pretty difficult to make a living as a farmer when you have no farmland. Um, and, uh, you know, people say, well, why do Palestinians resist? Well, one, they resist because the Israeli military is in their land. This is not Israel we're talking about. Palestinians aren't going into Israel, Israeli territory and, um, you know, setting up shop. They're in their own territory where their fathers were born, where their grandfathers were born, where their grandfather's fathers were born. Um, and uh, in my experience, the majority were simple farmers and the majority have nothing left. Um, so you can ask, why do they resist? Well, there's really nothing, nothing left to do except resist. So I was with a group, International Solidarity Movement. Uh, it was the group Rachel Corey was, was a part of when she was ran over by an Israeli bulldozer. Um, it was the group that Tristan Anderson was a part of when he was shot in the face with a high-velocity tear gas round, uh, a tear gas round that's meant only to be shot into buildings, although uh, for a while this year, starting with the Gaza War. Um, well, it's kind of uncomfortable to, to try to talk into this microphone. Can you guys all hear me if I don't do this? No, you cannot? Okay. I, I have to talk into here for the, uh, for the camera. Um, uh, well, I guess I lost my train of thought, but Tristan Anderson was, was uh, in, in April, I think, was shot in the face with a high-velocity tear gas round. It's a tear gas round that's meant only to be shot into buildings. Um, there was uh, an offensive in Gaza. The, is the Israeli military went into Gaza, killed 1,400 people. 1,100 of them were civilians, confirmed by the United Nations um, this year. And during the Gaza war, it, it started stepping up its violence against demonstrators in the West Bank because it knew, I believe, that uh, media would be focused on the 1,400 people, 1,100 of whom were civilians, that it killed in Gaza and would not pay attention to what it was doing in the West Bank. And I think it was right. So it started shooting people with, with these high-velocity rounds that are only meant to be shot into buildings. Um, in Nileen, one of the villages I was in, it, it introduced a new round, a 22 round. Um, the M16 fires a 5.56 millimeter, or a .223 round, but Israel's gotten a, an attachment, so it'll fire a 22 round out of, out of the M16, and they say it's like a BB. They say it's non-lethal, and it's approved to disperse non-violent demonstrations. Um, so during Gaza War, they introduced these two new weapons, the high-velocity tear gas round and the 22 bullet out of the M16. Um, and they've killed quite a few people since then. Anyways, not to digress about that, but as far as international solidarity goes, um, two people you might have heard of would be Tristan Anderson, who is now crippled, uh, is basically a vegetable, and, uh, and Rachel Corey, who was ran over by a, by a bulldozer. Um, international Solidarity Movement is, is quite a unique organization, I think. It's a group of internationals who uh, are, are dedicated to resisting the occupation, but it's, uh, by principle, a Palestinian-led organization. Okay. Thanks for bearing with us. By, by a Palestinian-led organization, what I mean is, is you know, ISM is full of a, a bunch of internationals um, they don't go there and decide, well, this is how Palestinians should resist the occupation. This is what Palestinians should do. This is what they shouldn't do. No, um, ISM uh, is a group of internationals that gets together with Palestinians, ask the Palestinians, how do you want to resist the military occupation? And we'll go with you and we'll help you. Um, uh, so the leadership of ISM is, is, is entirely Palestinian. Um, uh, it's an it's a organization based on the principle of nonviolence. If there's violence used uh, uh, at demonstrations, 
ISM will not be a part of it. Um, it's also based on uh, consensus. Uh, so anyways, there's this website, palsolidarity.org. Pal Can you all hear me with this microphone? It's OK? Yeah? OK. Um, anyways, when I first arrived, I came to, uh, to East Jerusalem, to Damascus Gate. Uh, and I just thought I'd, <laughs> I'd throw in a picture, because it's always nice to know what you're talking about. So that's a nice picture of, of Damascus Gate, um, which is in East Jerusalem, uh, or Al-Quds is the Arabic word for it. Um, the first place I went when I got there was a, a neighborhood called Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, Sheikh Jarrah is a, a neighborhood with 28 families. These are all families of the 1948 Nakba. Um, uh, Nakba means disaster. It's actually been banned by the state of Israel in all textbooks sold in Israel. You're not allowed to use the word Nakba. Anyways, when the state of Israel was created uh, and Israel went on the offensive, it displaced 800,000 people. Um, the, the, uh, those people have never been allowed to return to their homeland, even though they hold valid title to their land. Um, now, there's a right of return for Israelis. There's no right of return for Palestinians who were displaced in 1948. Ask yourself why. It's an interesting question. Um, anyways, Sheikh Jarrah is a neighborhood. It's, it's very close to Ramallah. Uh, if you get on a bus, it's maybe 10 minutes to the checkpoint or something like that, or 15 minutes to the main checkpoint um, going into Ramallah. Uh, this land was given to, to these refugees of the 1948 uh, genocide, essentially, um, uh, in, in uh, 1948 by Jordan. And the families that live there have been living there since 1956. So again, you have uh, you know, a current resident's father and his father's father were probably born there. Um, and they expect their children to be born there as well. Um, Sheikh Jarrah was occupied by Israel in 1967 during the war. Uh, and the government and settler organizations have been trying to cleanse the area of Palestinians since. Um, East Jerusalem is, is uh, a big target of ethnic cleansing right now. And um, it's, it's sad. Anyways, this is the host family that I stayed with. They were evicted on August 2nd, unfortunately. Uh, uh, it's a family of three brothers and their families who are all living together. And now they are living under the stars because they were, they were evicted. Um, I'll tell you the story of them. Um, what happened after the 1967 war, uh, would you mind moving back? It's a little distracting. Thanks. After the, the 1967 war, um, a group of settler organizations uh, registered the land in the Israeli land registry. You know, um, they filed documents that said, this land belongs to us. Uh, the families of Sheikh Jarrah got a lawyer. The lawyer was Israeli. The lawyer made an agreement behind the family's back without their knowledge or consent, which would be malpractice in America. Um, and he settled the case. Uh, again, without their knowledge and consent. To this day, they dispute the validity of this agreement. He said, the families will cede the fact that they don't own the land if you give them protected residence status. Well, protected residence status means that you have to pay rent. Um, and how are you going to pay rent for land that belongs to you, right? The land does not belong to the, the settler organizations. There's no reason for the Palestinians to pay rent. It was given to them as refugees by the Jordanian government, and the Jordanian government did own the land. Anyways, um, in November 2006, the families were evict uh, well, the family I stayed with was evicted in 2001. Four to 500 soldiers came to their house in the middle of the night, put charges on the door, blew the door locks, came in, drug everybody out, kicking and screaming, um, took all their furniture out, smashed everything. You know, it's not enough just to take their furniture out and to take their sinks out and to take their bathtubs out. No, they have to smash it, too. You know, smash everything that they own. Um, they got back in, in in 2006 after the Israeli land registrar looked at the documents and said, hey, you know what? These settler organizations that registered the land, they don't own it. This is on the books. But in order to say the families do own it, they needed to rezone the property. And the court would not order the rezoning of the property. Meanwhile, the two settler organizations that own the land were allowed to sell the land. Right? Now, they've sold it to an investment company, a settler's investment company, who has submitted an uh, a proposal that's been basically approved to build 200 to 250 family units 
on this land plus a commercial center. Um, and, you know, uh, there's one thing to settle in territory that nobody lives in, but there's another thing to settle in territory where there already are people. And this is territory where there's already people. They clearly own the land. Um, three families have been evicted so far, including the family that I stayed with for two and a half weeks. A beautiful family, absolutely beautiful family. They got, I don't know, lots of kids. Kids are all in school. They're all tons of fun, you know, independent people, uh, free thinkers, everything that you could ask for. Um, and uh, again, they sleep under the stars now. They sleep across the street underneath an olive tree in protest. Um, last, when I left, and this was before two of the families had been evicted, but when I left in July, uh, eviction procedure had begun against at least seven other families besides these. I think it might be 11 or something now. So, you know, all the families aren't going to get evicted at once, but you're going to turn around one day and there's going to be no Palestinians left in Sheikh Jarrah. And Sheikh Jarrah is not the only neighborhood in East Jerusalem where this is happening. All of East Jerusalem is being cleared of Palestinians. All of it. Um, when I talk about Silwan, which might be next, I'll maybe get into a little more. Um, the first family that got evicted from Sheikh Jarrah was the Al-Kurd family. Um, they were evicted, and like a week later, the, the father of the household died of a heart attack. I mean, put two and two together, I think we know what killed him. Um, they set up a protest tent uh, outside their property, and their protest tent's been demolished, I think, six times before they finally came to an agreement that it could, could remain there. And I've stayed in this tent. We had a party there. We got, you know, the settler children come down and throw rocks at us for having a dance party, right? We're not bothering anybody. We're not doing anything. But, um, you know, the lady who lives there, since her husband died, she's maybe 65 or 70 or something, They've thrown tear gas in her tent. I mean, this is teaching people how to hate before people know how to walk. And there's something wrong with that. Um, you know, who throws tear gas in the tents of, of old ladies? I, I don't know who does that. But, um, uh, you know, I had rocks thrown at me at a, at a dance party at this protest tent, which they have a right to be there. I mean, they were evicted from their own land. Um, anyway, so that's the first family that... that uh, that was evicted, and then the second and the third families that happened on August 2nd. Here's a picture of the inside of the tent. The tent's quite a, quite a bit larger um, than this, but uh, I wasn't in the mindset. I guess I didn't know I'd, I'd want pictures of this when I did my speech, so it's the only picture I took. Um, Hanun family, it's the Hanun family is who I stayed with. Um, they've been in legal battles on and on and on for quite a long time. Um, they were finally evicted on August 2nd. Uh, they shut, soldiers shut down the whole neighborhood. Uh, hundreds of soldiers, everybody was drug out, kicking and screaming in their bedtime clothes, uh, and so forth. And, uh, they're not the first three families. They're not going to be the last. Um, they will probably all be removed. Uh, another place in East Jerusalem that's, that's quite a bit of interest for me is, is Silwan. Um, Silwan is also very interesting to Israel because it borders the Temple Mount um, uh, of the Old Temple. And it's also believed that King David might have moved there. Um, so anyways, this is, is right next to the Old City of, of Jerusalem. Uh, if you've ever been there, uh, it's very close. Um, this is a map of Silwan. And uh, if you get down into the streets, so one, it, I mean, it's, it's a rough neighborhood, kind of, uh, and it's all tagged up. But you'll see tags like this, and that's the shape of so one. Uh, it's just pride, you know, I think. Um, so one, like Sheikh Jarrah, like many other neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. By the way, I should have said this. In 1967, when, when it, uh, during the war, when Israel captured East Jerusalem, they declared that Jerusalem as a whole is the undivided capital of Israel. Um, every country in the world except for three, the, the three who oppose, uh, oppose anything Palestinian, which are America, Israel, and Micronesia. Um, I don't really know where Micronesia is, but uh, <laughs> uh, I don't even dare trying to find it on a map. It sounds too small. But those three countries oppose every revolu resolution uh, uh, against Palestine and, and you know, former apartheid state South Africa is a swing vote. Sometimes South Africa opposes Palestine as well. Um, 
but, but every country in the world except those three recognize East Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Palestine. Um, well, Israel recognizes uh, all of Jerusalem, East and West, as the undivided capital of Israel. Um, a bit of a problem there, but I would say that you know the vote goes with the 197 out of 200 countries in the world that, that agree that East Jerusalem belongs to Palestine. Anyways, uh, Silwan, along with much of East Jerusalem, was occupied in 1967 by Israeli soldiers. Um, pretty soon after that, the government and settler organizations backed by the government uh, started harassing the Palestinians. Um, and, you know, on the ground, there's things going on every day. I mean, Palestinian shops get smashed up. Um, Israeli settlers uh, have largely impunity. You know, they walk around with guns. Um, someone might sit down next to you with an M16 in his lap while you're trying to, uh, you know, eat dinner or have a nice lunch with somebody or something like that. Um, and they'll also go on rampages where they'll come into Palestinian areas and they'll smash everything up. It's worse in the farming areas where the settlers can come down and just steal the livestock or shoot the livestock or poison the water supply or shoot out the water supply or something like that. But it also happens in the city. And, and um, there, was, there was quite a few shops that got smashed up by settlers while I was in Silwan. Um, Anyways, Israel claims that Silwan is part of King David's empire, and so therefore it belongs to Israel by, by some sort of historical right. Um, and uh, right now, Israel, the Israeli government has four to 500 orders to demolish four to 500 different houses and so on. It's not that big of a neighborhood, um, but they have orders to demolish four to 500 houses. I mean, you know, what, what happens to a neighborhood where settlers want to move into when you demolish 500 houses? Well, I think the neighborhood's going to change. And so does Israel. That's why they're doing it. Um, most, the majority of these demolition orders are for what they call illegal building. Now, it's funny because if you look for a case of illegal building demolitions in West Jerusalem, you won't find it. That's, that's undisputed Israeli side Jerusalem. Um, uh, PalestineMonitor.org, I think, keeps statistics on this. Um, if, if you want to go check them out. The last statistics I saw were in 2005, and I, I don't remember what the statistics were, but there was, you know, there was something like five times or ten times as many cases of illegal building in West Jerusalem, and there was no demolitions in 2005 in West Jerusalem. Now, for illegal building in East Jerusalem, well, your house will get demolished. Um, and this is something that builds on its own because of the culture of the territory. If someone gets put out, they go to their family um, so, like, if my brother's house gets demolished, he's going to come and move in with me. But if he moves in with me, I might need to build another room on my house. And if I need to build another room on my house, then they're going to demolish my house for illegal building. Well, maybe we have a third brother that we have to go live with then, you know. Uh, and so it's like a self-perpetuating cycle once you start, start the demolitions. Um, and on top of that, it's, it's nearly impossible for Palestinians to obtain a building permit in East Jerusalem, particularly. I mean, you spend three years with the Israeli government, spend 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 shekels, uh, and you get denied. You know, what's the point? You're not going to get a permit. Um, uh, you know, and a building permit's required for things such as fixing, fixing roofs. If you want to fix your roof, you need a permit. You fix your roof without a permit because it's leaking and it's getting your family all wet in pneumonia, well, your house will get demolished and, and uh, things will be worse. Um, you know, so it's, it's kind of uh, these slowly but surely tactics of getting rid of the Palestinians that's going on right now. Um, it's easy to shift the blame, oh, they built illegally, so we're pushing them out. Well, uh, you know, if you look at the big picture, what's going on is is Israel's fulfilling its policy that it announced in 1967 that East Jerusalem would be the undivided capital of Israel. Uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I said East Jerusalem, that all of Jerusalem, including East Jerusalem, would be the undivided capital of Israel. Um, meaning that they have to get rid of who is already there, which is, of course, Palestinians. Too bad for them. Um, so this is a couple of pictures of the Sowan area. Um, it's built in a big valley so it's, it's hard to get really good pictures, or maybe I wasn't adventurous enough. But these are the two pictures I took of the neighborhood. Um, again, four to 500 demolition orders in this neighborhood. Uh, here's kind of like what the streets are. Um, and they got some real nice graffiti uh, in these streets, you know. 
Now, a bigger issue in Silwan is that, okay, so you have these four to 500 orders to dem dem demolish houses, and most of them are for what they call illegal building, um, which is, is a farce if you ask me. But 88 of the demolition orders, they're, they're outright taking the land. Um, you know, in America, you can't take land without just compensation or whatnot. Well, here, they're just taking the land. They're demolishing the houses, and they're taking the land. Um, and the reason they're doing it is to clear a way to build an archaeological park. Now, 1,500 people, half of which are children. There's a very high child population in Palestine. Um, 1,500 people, half of which are children, are going are gonna to be homeless. So that Israel, in what's recognized as belonging to Palestine, by 197 of 200 countries in the world, uh, can build an archaeological park. And what's the point of this archaeological park? Well, the point of the archaeological park is to look for evidence that King David was in Silwan. So Israel can say, well, look, we have a historical claim. I mean, aside from the fact that, that Israelis left Israel a very long time ago, um, uh, there's, this, uh, there's this claim, well, look, we have a historic right to this land because we were here a really long time ago. We haven't been here since, but a very long time ago we were. Um, therefore, it's ours. Now, uh, I mean, the second point kind of speaks for itself. The archaeological contract was given to a, an archaeology company owned by the settlers that want to move into Silwan. Do you think they're going to find evidence that King David was in Silwan? Yeah, they are, of course. I mean, how, how are they going to find anything else? Um, so, you know, this is just, it's, it's a, a facade. Um, uh, but the world's buying it right now, unfortunately. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy that there's so many open-minded people who are interested in... in actually learning about this part of the world because I think so many people say this is so complicated what's going on I don't even want to know and they just let the American government continue to support Israel um, and the fact of the matter is Israel could not do what it's doing without American money and without American weapons there's no way that any of this could continue if it didn't have tons I mean at, you know every single soldier is, is, is got an M16 where's the M16 made they're not made in Israel they're made in America, M16s, right? That's like our staple rifle. Um, so anyways, uh, uh, that's, that's great. That's just great. Um, Nylene is, is a small village. It's where Tristan Anderson got shot in the face with that high-velocity tear gas round. Uh, Saluk, I think, is the word. Although, I don't know. My pronunciation is not right. But um, uh, It's a population 4,500. It's outside Ramallah. Um, the wall started there one year ago. Later on, I'm going to... Con I, I organized this talk kind of in order of when I was in each place. Um, I'm going to contrast this to another village outside Ramallah called Belayin, which is 1,800 people, and the wall started there five years ago, and the wall there is almost complete. This is a slightly larger village. The wall started just one year ago. It's not complete. Um, and I think those two villages kind of go hand in hand in a lot of ways, but... Um, so keep that in mind. But Nylene's a village of 4,500 people where the wall started a year ago. Um, originally, and I don't really know how big a dunham is, but that's the form of measurement we have. Um, uh, it, a dunham's large enough for one family, you know, one Arabic-sized family to live on, if you look at Sheikh Jarrah, so it's, it's large enough. Um, but, but between the wall, uh, Israeli settlements, and... Uh, roads that are segregated and used only by settlers. Um, you know, settlers have their own armies, uh, just so you know. Um, they're armed to the teeth. And, um, you know, they'll build their own roads and then they'll use their own army to, to uh, police those roads. And nobody goes on those roads except settlers. Um, you know, there's a village I'll show you later, Yanun, of 300 people, where there's, there's like four guard outposts built around this village of 300 people. You know, what do you need, what do you need four guard outposts? Um, for a settlement when you just have a village of 300 simple farmers. I mean, they don't even have probably one toothbrush in the whole village, much less anything that could threaten Israel uh, or the settlers. But, um, you know, settlers have their own armies and, and their own armies enforce all kinds of injustice. They're worse than soldiers in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, but anyways, between the wall settlements and, and segregated settler-only roads, Nileen's got 7,300 Dunhams of 58,000 Dunhams that belong to, uh, uh, to the village in Eileen. And so many families in Eileen have absolutely nothing left. And they're, they're a farming village, like most of the West Bank. Um, and they have nothing. What are they supposed to do when, uh, when so much of their land's been taken? I mean, 
you ask why they go to the wall and throw stones at soldiers. Well, what do you think that they're supposed to do? You know? Anyways, here's a picture of Nylene. Uh, most of it. And I, I included a decent amount of pictures. I just wanted to kind of show you what, you know, so we know what we're talking about. Um, these are just pictures of the village. It's a nice village. And uh, I don't know Arabic very well, but here they say all their K's as C-H, so everything sounds different in, in this village. Um, this is kind of a cool little spot where you could get away from the sun. Uh, we'd hang out, but... Um, this is kind of where you'd meet to start marching out against the fence. Uh, I actually ran into one of these cactuses walking really fast. It kind of hurts. Um, this was a memorial. Uh, I was in Nylene for a demonstration like three days after I, after I arrived in, in Palestine. Um, they demonstrate every Friday against the wall. Um, the Friday before I got there, I got there on a Monday. And the Friday before that, so like three days before that, Israel killed somebody. Um, they had shot a boy in the leg that they claimed was throwing stones. Uh, they had shot him in the leg, and he's paralyzed, we've found out since. Um, he was 17 years old. And uh, um, one, of the, one of the biggest forms of torture that Israel uses is medical neglect. And so they'll hurt you and then not let you see a doctor until you, you know, sign the confession or whatever. And also, uh, uh, coerced confessions can convict third parties. You know, so if they torture me and then I say, oh, he did it, well, that's enough to convict that person, you know. So uh, medical, medical neglect is, is a big form of torture. Um, the reason I bring that up, they shot the 17-year-old boy, a 35-year-old man with three, three kids and a pregnant wife um, who was just leaving the demonstration. His wife, I think, was driving or was in the passenger seat and their kids were in the back. Saw this boy get shot, got out of his car. He was leaving. This was at the end of a demonstration got out of his car, ran down to grab the boy to drag him out so he could see a doctor so he didn't get medical neglected by, by soldiers. And they shot him in the heart with uh, one of those non-lethal BB-22 bullets out of the M16 that I was telling you about earlier. Um, and, of course, it was lethal as to him. Uh, so this was a memorial erected for him. He was killed, like, uh, you know, three days before I got there. Um, and I was at the next Friday demonstration. And so the next pictures I'll show you were from the Friday demonstration the week after they, they killed this man. It's named Akel. Um, just one other point. Uh, Israel's working on a tunnel uh, to completely close Nileen off from the outside world, which they've done in a lot of places in the West Bank. Um, the current road that goes in and out of Nileen that all the, uh, the Palestinians that live there use is going to be a segregated settler-only road. Um, and that's going to split the village into two parts. So this is a village where there's decent resistance. It's only 4,500 people, but they're fighting. And again, why are they fighting? Because Israeli soldiers are on their territory. This is not Israel we're talking about. This is the territory of Palestine, recognized by 197 of 200 countries in the world as belonging to Palestine. So you ask why they resist. Well, why is Israel in their territory in the first place? That's, I think, a better question. Um, but uh, the resistance is, is strong. 4,500 people is a rather large village. Um, now, splitting the village in two parts is obviously going to weaken the village quite a lot. Um, that could split families from families and so on and so forth, like we've seen with the wall all over the place. Um, they're going to replace that village, uh, that, that road into Nileen with a tunnel. And the tunnel can be closed with one jeep. And so anytime Israel wants to close off this whole village, they close off the whole village. You know, Hebron, I think, had curfew something like 24 hours a day for like, I don't know, three months or six months or something like that, you know, where you don't leave your house for six months or you get shot on the street. It's a shoot on sight order. You know, uh, curfew is, uh, you see what's, what's being planned for Nileen. They're, they're crushing the resistance. And this is just resistance. International law says that an occupied people has the right to resist a military occupation. I mean, I don't think anybody argues that what Algiers did fighting France was wrong, right? Algiers is, is, is like a sign of anti-colonialism struggle or whatever, anti-imperialist struggle. Um, you know, I, I don't really see much of a difference. Uh, you could use Vietnam if you need another example. For some reason, my computer screens... Here we go. 
So in the last year, uh, the wall started just one year ago. So the history of demonstrations in Eileen is a year old. There's been five Palestinians killed in the last year. Two of them were killed during the Gaza War. Like I said, Israel stepped up violence in the West Bank during the Gaza War this year. You know, all the eyes were turned to Gaza, so we knew we could get away with some stuff in the West Bank. Um, the first Palestinian they killed was a 10-year-old boy. The second Palestinian they killed was a 17-year-old boy at the 10-year-old boy's funeral. They came to the 10-year-old boy's funeral and they killed a 17-year-old boy there. They killed two people in Gaza during the Gaza War. They killed two people in this village. Um, and then the week before I got there, they killed Akel, who was going to rescue a 17-year-old boy um, and who now has uh, a widow and now probably four children if his unborn baby was, was born alive. Um, at least 38 have been shot with live ammunition. Uh, 13 houses at least have been set on fire. At least 80 boys have been kidnapped. Um, it's where Tr I just threw this last one in because I think a lot of people know who Tristan Anderson is. And this is where he was shot in the face with the, the high-velocity tear gas round. Um, that round that's really only made to be shot into buildings uh, and to go through bulletproof glass and so on and so forth. Um, I have some pictures from the demonstration, and I also included a video of this demonstration because I thought some people made, some nice, uh, made a nice video of this demonstration. Uh, they generally do a prayer. Uh, again, ISM, and it's not just ISM in Nileen demonstrating. There's all kinds of people. There's Israelis as well. There's a group, Israeli anarchists against the wall. They bring flowers for the soldiers every week. It's kind of nice. Um, but uh, it's not just ISM, and again, ISM is a Palestinian-led organization. So ISM doesn't plan, plan this. Um, you know, you have Palestinians who live in Nileen that are planning this, and we ask them what they want us to do. A lot of times it's just stand up at the front with us so that when we're trying to cut the fence out, uh, the Israeli military can't shoot us because they're not supposed to fire live ammo into the crowds with internationals. Although, since the introduction of this 22 round, um, they have been doing that. But, uh, and one of my friends was actually shot in the knee with it. Um, but here's a couple pictures. They march, on the, they march on the fence. And, you know, there's like two kinds of demonstrations that ISM is really involved with. One is kind of facing down soldiers, I suppose, and the other is kind of facing down settlers. Um, the majority of the settler problems, settlers are a problem everywhere, but the but, um, majority of the settler problems are down south around Hebron. Um, and this, a classic case there is that settlers will attack a village. The Israeli military will come in and say, violence between these settlers and this village is inevitable. Therefore, we need a closed military buffer zone between, between the two communities. Well, the buffer zone that they create is always farmland owned by the Palestinians. Um, and so one of the big things that ISM will do down around Hebron especially is, is a company... Uh, uh, Palestinian farmers to graze their crops. You know, there's a lot of shepherds down there particularly. So, um, you know, they've been closed off all their grazing land by settler attacks. And, you know, it's the settlers doing the attacking. So you think that the closed military buffer zone should be settler territory, not that they lawfully own the territory anyways, by the way, by the way. But, you know, we have a current situation, we have to deal with it. So since they are there, um, you would think that it would be their territory that would become the buffer zone, but no, um, that's not how it works. So the second type of demonstration that we'll get involved with um, is when a group of Palestinians will want to march on the wall and cut the wall down and um, maybe throw stones at soldiers or something. And, uh, you know, I said ISM is a nonviolent organization. Um, we don't really believe that throwing stones at tanks is a violent act. Um, especially when we're talking about an occupied people. You know, we're not talking about people going into the territory of Israel and throwing stones at Israeli civilians. That's not it at all. We're talking about people living in Palestine who have had virtually everything that they have taken away from them, whose families have had everything taken away from them, uh, doing symbolic resistance against a military occupier. Um, you know, throwing a stone at a tank, I can't, I don't know what it is besides symbolic resistance because I think we all know that it's not going to damage the tank, right? Or a better example, a, a popular thing to do is to fill a glass jar up with paint and throw that at the tank, right? Because then you mark it and then you say, well, look, I got you, you know? Uh, it's symbolic resistance, you know? So uh, that does happen. Um, and uh, ISM is also of the mindset, or at least I'm of the mindset, that even if you think stone throwing is violent, 
um, having a group of internationals standing with the stone throwers de-escalates the, the violence of the Israeli soldiers in response. Um, because having stones on one side and having M16s uh, on the other side is, is not uh, proportionate. Um, and so by having internationals there, you de-escalate the reaction of the Israeli soldiers, which is a principle of nonviolence. Anyways, um, that's the type of demonstration we're talking about here. Uh, it, this is a demonstration to march on the wall, uh, to try to, to cut down the fence. The wall is an electric fence in a lot of places, um, especially where it's not complete, like in, uh, in Eileen. And, uh, you know, we're here to, to, to march on it and cut it down. And then the Palestinian boys, uh, you know, they do what they do. Um, here's the soldiers that were there when we first got there. Um, a lot of times the soldiers will shoot tear gas right into the prayer group that I showed you before and not even give a demonstration a chance uh, to be stone free, for example. And again, I don't really believe throwing stones at tanks is violent. But even if you do... There's a lot of demonstrations where the Palestinians get tear gas during prayer before anything that anybody could even argue is violent has ever happened. You know, this is just suppression of, of, of free speech. Um, and again, I think it's very important to understand that we're not talking about Israeli territory here. We're talking about the territory of Palestine. Um, so some soldiers showed up, some kids cut some wall, uh, and, you know, they're, they're trying to tear away some of this razor wire. Uh, some more soldiers show up. They shot a whole ton of tear gas at us. Um, they had just killed somebody the week before, so they didn't shoot any live ammunition. Um, the way it generally happens is the Israeli soldiers will disperse the internationals with tear gas, and then the Palestinian kids will step forward and start throwing stones. So here you have some kids throwing some stones. Again, it's symbolic resistance. Um, and I have a video I'd like to show you of that demonstration. And this was maybe like a two-hour demonstration. This is like a four-minute video, so it's just like a, it's just a clip, and it's only one camera person's perspective. Um, I think he missed a lot, but I think it's, it's a nice video, too. So that's like the beginning of tear, of tear gas. And that's not too big of a deal. I mean, they can shoot 32 tear gas canisters at a time. So, I mean, they've shot like five so far. It's not... Now here they're just trying to break this wall. Uh, it looks like they got a point on the fence that they're trying to collapse. And this is, you know, the main, the main goal of a lot of these demonstrations is, is to tear down the, the illegal wall that's being built. Which again, the International Court of Justice has ruled that this wall is illegal, by the way. Um, Now, this is probably after the internationals have been dispersed.
And you see what a couple stones, what kind of a reaction a couple stones will bring you. I mean, I think I heard that in four years or something of, of throwing stones for the last four years. Uh, that's when I left the demonstration. One of those almost hit me in the head. Uh, my friend told me to wash my head and I ducked and it landed like, if I'm here, it landed probably right there. So, so I left after, after that big round they fired. But um, uh, I've heard from the organization I was with that in the last, uh, the last like four years of, of, of throwing stones that one Israeli soldier has had his arm broken by a stone and that's the only reported injury um, over four years. So again, I can't stress enough, this is symbolic resistance. And on top of that, one, international law allows an occupied people to resist uh, a military occupation. Palestine and Palestinians are an occupied people and they're resisting. They, they're in their legal right to do so. Um, so I think we should all keep that in mind before we brand them terrorists for throwing stones at people who are, uh, you know, destroying their entire lives. Um, so, well, it looks like i got to catch back up. Sorry, it looks like the presentation restarted. So that was Nileen. That was my first demonstration uh, in Palestine. I had been there about four days, and, and the week before, uh, they paralyzed one boy and they killed another boy uh, with live ammunition for throwing stones that don't hit anybody um, or do any damage. Uh, here's the type of, t I just put this in, here's the type of tear gas canisters that they use. It was that third one in that they, they hurt Tristan with. That's the one that's only made to be really fired in the, in the crowds. I like these ones on the left the best because if they hit you in the head, they, they're really thick rubber and they bounce. Um, the ones they were using in Nileen that day were the ones on the, the far ones on, with the metal. Um, I included these pictures. These are rubber bullets. And a rubber bullets, another thing that they like to use against, against nonviolent um, demonstrators. Uh, this bullet right here, is the steel that's inside of the rubber bullet. And then this bullet right there is, is the steel with the rubber coating. They're not, they're not rubber bullets, they're, they're steel bullets with a very, you can see, you see the difference between the size of those two. They're steel bullets with very thin rubber coating. Um, these ones are a little better because they're not round so they don't like go inside the body as often or whatever. But um, when you hear rubber bullet, you should know what you're talking about. You're not talking about a bullet that's all rubber. You're talking about a bullet that's that much steel and and a tiny, tiny bit rubber. Um, and uh, this is another thing they use, and people who haven't been to very many, many demonstrations, this very effective against them, um, it's just a sound bomb or a percussion grenade or, or whatever you want to call it, a flash bomb or something. And it just makes a really big, loud noise, and if you haven't been around very much, then you think that they're really opening up on you and you run, but... Um, they're not too bad, really. Um, and I just put a picture because I think we all need to know these are not Israeli weapons that the Israeli military has. They're Toten M16s. Those are American weapons. So when you see you know, Israel doing something, America's complicit with that. Um, they get all their weapons from us. Now, Israel's working on its own gun. It's working on opening up weapons, weapons manufacturing to start producing its own, its own assault rifle. Um, but 99% of all the guns that you see Israeli soldiers with are M16s, that gun right there. Um, and uh, you can fire tear gas out of the M16s, you can fire rubber bullets out of the M16s, you can fire this, all kinds of you know, rounds, they have all kinds of attachments for it by now. Um, so anyways, on to a little nicer note. After that demonstration, I took a break from activism for a couple of days and I went to this place called Taiba, which is Ephraim in the Bible, is, is, um, is mentioned in all the king's books, like Samuel's and, and the two king's books and stuff, I think as Ophrah. Um, and it's, it's uh, I don't know my Bible all that well, but after like the Pharisees were threatening Jesus with death or something, before he was crucified, he retreated to Ephraim um, uh, with his disciples. And he was received there at this church and I just put pictures because I thought this was kind of a neat historic thing. Um, it's a 4th century church. Um, or I think this was built on the land where he had been received. Because obviously he wasn't received in the 4th century. He was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, but uh, he, he was allegedly received in, in the area where this church was built. Um, and this is a Byzantine, a Byzantine, Byzantine church, so it's, it's Orthodox. Um, uh, there's a brewery in Taiba. Uh, it was created after the Oslo Accords. Uh, they had a lot of problems getting banks to go along with it because 98% of Palestine doesn't drink. Um, but they do have a non-alcoholic beer coming out. Uh, it's a pretty good example of economic oppression. Um, I mean, I'll use the same words I put up there because I don't know, but West Bank's flooded with Israeli products all over. Barcode is 729. Um, you know, if you're in the West Bank and you don't want to buy Israeli, you don't buy barcodes starting with 729. But everything's fresh produce. Um, and so a lot of that comes from Israel as well. It's impossible, nearly impossible, for a West Bank business to send anything into Jerusalem. And because Gaza is under blockade and because West Bank's been separated from Gaza, Israel, uh, Palestine doesn't have its own port. So Palestine can't export things to other countries without sending them through Jerusalem. Um, so if you want to send anything into Jerusalem or it's into any other country, you've got to go through Jerusalem. Uh, it's nearly impossible. Um, you know, this brewery has so many stories about the stuff that's happened to them. They, their whole village had been closed for like two months uh, and had just been opened like a week before we came here. Um, so, for instance, like all their operations were, were shut down because Israel had closed down their entire village um, for like two months. Uh, only one road goes in and out. But, uh, you know, some, some of the more notable stories that they told us about, one time Israel refused to sell them bottles for a period of time. And then they imported a bunch of bottles from Portugal. And Israel said, no, you can't import those from Portugal because it hurts our economy that you don't buy them from us. And... Um, in another case, they held up a, a, a shipment of bottles uh, after they started letting bottles in. They held up a shipment for 10 months. What's a, what's a brewery supposed to do without bottles for 10 months? Um, they held it up for 10 months while, uh, uh, while they got the proper x-ray equipment. Well, I mean, if you've been through one Israeli checkpoint, you know that one thing that Israel has is x-ray machines. Um, and, uh, you know, holding up a shipment of bottles for 10 months over x-ray, I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, when they do want to export bottles, and they do export to like Japan and Italy and stuff. Um, it's very good beer, by the way. It's very delicious. Um, uh, they have to go like seven hours out of the way. Um, settlements own the roads all around, and uh, Palestinians aren't allowed to use settler roads. And so they have to use roads that damage their vehicles. The underside of their vehicles are damaged every shipment that they make. And they have to use three to four different vehicles um, because at certain checkpoints, vehicles can't go past the checkpoints. I even heard once that, uh, and I read a story about Israel making a mule go through a checkpoint once. Um, I don't know if this, I think the soldiers must have been bored. But um, anyways, it's not good for beer in 120 degree heat to be reloaded and unloaded uh, that many times. Um, but that's, that's Taiba or Ephraim. Uh, it was a nice place. Um, I moved up to Nablus, and I was kind of, uh, I was living in Nablus for the rest of the time that I was here, although I was, it's a small country, and I was moving around a lot. Um, but I just threw in a couple pictures of Nablus. I, I really am fond of this city. Um, it's a beautiful city. Uh, it's built in a valley, um, and I get lost everywhere I go. But I didn't get lost here because it's built in a valley, and there's one main road that goes along the bottom of the valley, and everything's built up from there. And so you just know where the main road is, and you're, you're okay. Can everybody still hear me, by the way? Is my voice gone? Okay. I feel like I'm talking softer or something. Um, I was staying real close to this. It's like the biggest mosque in, in Nablus, and I could see it from my roof, so I took a picture of it. It's called Hajj Mazus, or Masjid, or there's a couple other names for it. I'm not sure what they are. Um, Nablus is where Jacob's Well Church is. Um, it's like a famous Christian church as well. Um, and this was also from the roof where I was staying. I thought it was nice. When I first got there, after I'd been there for a while, you know, with each successive day, the sun would set more to the right and more to the right and more to the right. And eventually it went behind, you know, that stuff and you couldn't see it anymore. But, but for about a week when I was there, we had sunsets like this before it moved over. And I thought it was a nice picture. I wanted to show you guys. Um, pretty soon after going to Nablus, I went to a demonstration in Azun. Uh, Azun is a village. Azun Atma is... Uh, is uh, a village that used to be part of Azun. It means like night. Atma, I think, means like black or night. 
or something. So it's like the night of Azun or Black Azun. Um, this is a portion of the village that was, was completely isolated by, by settlements, by the wall, or by settler-only roads. The only way in and out is through a gate. The gates close 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. every day. Um, uh, you know, if you have a medical emergency and the gate's closed, you're out of luck. I think um, Palestine Monitor has reported at least like 70 women have given birth at checkpoints, for instance. You know, So when you have a gl uh, only way in and out of your tiny little village is is closed during those hours, you can have some serious problems. Um, and only residents are allowed in. So if you're a woman and you marry outside a village and your name changes, you might not be able to go back. Um, so we were at a demonstration to the gate. We wanted to, while well, the Palestinians we were with wanted to occupy the gate. Um, unfortunately, the Israeli military vehicles got there first and they pushed us back. Um, but this is the gate we're talking about. This is the only way in and out of this village. Um, they're completely isolated from the outside world uh, at the whim of Israel. We had a nice, nice nonviolent demonstration. This was the first demonstration at this gate in over a year. Uh, the last demonstration at this gate, there was a thousand people there and, and um, lots of brutality by the Israeli soldiers. It scared people so bad they wouldn't, they wouldn't do the demonstrations. This was the first one in a year and it was, it was fairly polite. Um, although they did send these three snipers up in our back well, the first one we got there, they, there's a hill behind us, and they sent these guys up um, uh, as, as sniper lookouts. But here's some signs. Here's the group, rather small group. And here's these guys walking up in our back. And it's, it's, a, little, it's a little eerie to have, you know, snipers, uh, you know, 40 yards up behind you um, at a nonviolent protest. You know, you wonder what's, what's, what's the, the need for this, but they do it. Um... This I don't want to talk too long about. I heard there was a demolition in Silwan. Uh, this is pretty much just made in chronolog chronological order. But the next thing that, uh, you know, I was back in Nablus probably for a little while eating kanafa or something. Uh, the famous uh, dessert of, of Nablus is delicious. Uh, it's like fried cheese and some other stuff. Uh, but anyways, Silwan, where there's the four to 500 demolition orders and 100 are for the archaeological park. Um, we heard there was a demolition there, and so we went there to try to get in the way. Um, it turned out it was in this other place. This I just guessed on the spelling. The thing about Arabic words is they're written in, in a different alphabet, and so when you try to translate them, you could spell them like a million different ways. I, I have no idea if this is even close to the correct spelling, but it's how it sounded to me. So, uh, Is it? Do you know? Uh, but uh, somewhere in East Jerusalem. It appeared that they were building a new military base, although there was an existing military base about 20 yards from the spot. Um, we weren't allowed close enough to see anything. There was, uh, there was two, two mounted soldiers who left. This big group of soldiers, there's a group of snipers up on top of the hill, um, and they had some pretty vicious dogs. I didn't get very good pictures of dogs, but I've never seen a dog this big before. I mean, these are like ponies. Um, uh, and uh, so... Uh, I was invited after that to a lecture about um, Palestinians incarcerated in Israeli prisons at, at Anajah University, which is in Nablus. Um, and uh, that was very informative. There was four speakers. The first one uh, was incarcerated for 14 months at age 14 and a half. You're an adult by Israeli standards at age 14 if you're Palestinian, um, which is when you can be treated like an adult in jail, uh, age 14. The second speaker was a woman who was incarcerated for six years. The third was a man who was incarcerated nine years. He spent four months in a secret prison. Um, two of his brothers had been assassinated, uh, and one of his brothers in prison for life. Uh, and the fourth was a lawyer with uh, 18 years' experience. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, this lawyer says, look, I have 18 years' experience, and I go into court every day, and I don't know what law to argue from because, because uh, when it comes to Palestinians, the, the judges change the law every single day. Um, so uh, he said his experience didn't help out too much um, because there, there, there's you know, no, no set law. Um, these are statistics that were given during this lecture. Seven, 750,000 prisoners from the West Bank between the 67 war and 2000. Um, 75,000 detained between 02 and 09. 02 was the second intifada, by the way, the second uprising. Um, since 2002, a population of around 9,000 Palestinians and we're talking, I think, 2.2 million Palestinians in Palestine, I think, something like that. Um, 
or maybe it's 2.2 in the West Bank and uh, one point something in Gaza. Either way, it's not a very large population. Um, and uh, they gave a statistic at least 196 have been martyred by, by medical neglect, which, as I said, is, is a very popular and effective form of torture. Um, today, there's 11,500 Palestinians in Israeli prisons. Here's the breakdown. Um, and uh, the statistic that they gave in the lecture was that there was more than 20 in secret prisons. No journalist has ever been allowed into an Israeli secret prison, nor is the Red Cross. So um, I'm sure it's difficult to get that statistic. Um, the, the prison system's a little unjust, I would say, to say uh, at least. Under the military command of 67, and again, this is not a law governing actions within the territory of Israel. This is a law governing uh, actions that take place within the occupied territory of Palestine. So this is Israel as a state making law inside of Palestine. It would be like if America said, Mexicans, when you do this, we're going to punish you. Um, we wouldn't do that because we're not Mexico. We're not the Mexican government. It's not our business to be doing that. Just like it's not the business of the Israeli government to be going into Palestine and creating uh, punitive laws. But uh, that's what this military command is. It's, it's a command uh, for the occupied territories. So I think it's very important to keep in mind that we're not talking about Israel here. We're talking about uh, law that Israel is making inside of uh, uh, another state, Palestine. But uh, you get 10 years for throwing a stone under this order, or 20 years for throwing a stone at a, a military vehicle. Um, the lawyer said that these kind of sentences uh, make it such that every single boy who's arrested for throwing stones makes a plea bargain. Because Israel will say, look, the books say we can throw 20 years at you, uh, if you say that the village elders told you to throw the stones, we'll give you six months. Um, you want to risk 20 years? Or, or, you know, the lawyer would say, look, I'd have a good case, you know, but I'd have to think, like, you know, I do have a good case, but if I go into court and I lose that case, uh, you know, I'm looking at 20 years, they're giving us a plea bargain for six months. Um, you know, so this really stacks the convictions, having such harsh sentences uh, available. Um, and uh, I thought this was a, a notable incident that's worth pointing out to everybody. There is a settler, an Israeli settler named Corman, who followed an 11-year-old Palestinian boy home to his own house. And inside the Palestinian boy's own house, the settler beat him to death. He beat him so badly, he broke his skull and he severed his spinal cord. You have to beat somebody pretty badly to do that. Um, he got community service as a punishment. Um, you know, go look it up. It's, it's, it's not a secret. Um, so you get 10 years for throwing a stone. You get 20 years for throwing a stone at a tank. But if you're an Israeli settler, you can beat an 11-year-old boy so badly to death that you break his, his skull and his spinal cord inside his own house. You know, you wonder how settlers drive Palestinians out of their own villages through terror like this. People think, look, look, look what could happen to me in my own house. Um, community service. That's the punishment. Corman. Uh, in this uh, lecture they went to talk about administrative detention administrative detention is not to punish actual violations of the law it's to prevent future threats um, it's like what we do with our enemy combatants in Guantanamo we don't have to give a reason for why we're detaining them we just have to say well we think they might be a threat later well anybody might be a threat later you know. so under a regime of administrative detention you, know, you can pretty much detain anybody you want um, administrative detention is governed by the Geneva Conventions. I think it's the fourth Geneva Convention that regulates warfare. Um, and uh, um, unfortunately, it does sponsor the practice, but it also lays a bunch of regulations on the use of the practice. And, and, and Israel definitely violates at least uh, five of those regulations. Between 2000, I mean, you, you can see these statistics, right? You know, there's 11,000 detainees between those years. and there's 3,000 in 2002 at the start of the second uprising. Um, today, there's 600. You can get detained for six months at a time, but you can have that indefinitely renewed by a judge who says six months more, okay. We need more time to gather evidence, okay, six months more. Um, you could be detained indefinitely. Um, now, uh, there's five ways in which Israel violates international law in the way that it, it uh, implements its regime of administrative detentions. One, uh, and this is according to the Fourth Geneva Convention. When an occupying power 
administratively detain somebody, they have to support that person's family during the period of detention. Um, Israel doesn't do that. Um, you know, if you detain the father of a household who's responsible for nine children and his wife and, you know, maybe his sister and his mother, uh, well, um, you know, it, that hurts. What's your family supposed to do? Um, uh, the administrative detainees are supposed to be separated from other prisoners, but they're commingled in Israeli prisons. Uh, you know, because they haven't actually done anything wrong. That's, that's the key of an administrative detainee. They've done nothing wrong. They're just perceived as a future threat. Well, they're supposed to be treated differently from other prisoners. That's why they're supposed to be separated, but they're not. Um, they're supposed to be just dressed differently, but they're not. Um, orange jumpsuits are becoming pretty common in Israel, I've heard, um, modeled after the Guantanamo detainees. Um, really, the bottom line is these are being treated as prisoners of war, um, when in reality they're political prisoners or, or prisoners of an occupying power. Um, uh, fourth violation, occupying powers under the Fourth Geneva Convention are forbidden from transporting administrative detainees from the place of the arrest, which would be in the occupied territories of Palestine, into the territory of the occupier, into Israel. But that is a very common practice. So they'll go administrative detain somebody in Palestine, bring them to Israel, and throw them in Israeli prison. And then the fifth violation, when the detainees' families want to come visit, which Geneva requires that they be allowed to do, uh, 40 to 50 percent of them are forbidden. And that's, that's, of course, related to the fourth one, because you illegally transport detainees out of the occupied territory uh, into the territory of the occupier. And then you say, well, look, we can't let you into our territory. That would jeopardize our, our security. Um, so uh, uh, these are some things I learned in, in this prison lecture. Um, there's also a regime of court-martials, which are military trials. Nearly everybody is, is convicted that's brought up on a court-martial. Um, coerced confessions, confessions under torture, are sufficient to convict third parties. So if they capture me and they torture me until I'm willing to talk, and I say, he did something, that guy had a bullet a year ago, um, my coerced confession is enough to convict that person without a trial in a court-martial. Um, so, you know, you see what kind of justice we have here. And, you know, Palestine and Israel, they're not in an overt state of war, so you wonder why do we have uh, this kind of thing. Um, so interrogation violates international law in a whole lot of ways, and I think um, it would take, uh, you know, a whole other lecture to even talk about that but you can see some of the stuff that goes on. You have four to seven days of interrogation. You might get one to two hours of rest per day. Um, you probably beat and are bound so badly. Like being bound backwards in the shape of a banana is apparently fairly, fairly popular. You might be bound so badly you can't stand um, and put into isolation where you never see another person. Uh, there's, there's different forms of interrogation. During the court martials, I guess the prisoners get, get the worst treatment because they're perceived as like time bombs. Um, but nevertheless, there's an Israeli Supreme Court decision, kind of a famous decision sanctioning torture. Um, they approve shaking a prisoner to death or until brain damage. Um, and then there's secret interrogation, which was spoken about by a prisoner who spent four months in a secret prison. Um, he said solitary confinement is very common. Um, uh, uh, under international law, by the way, prisoners are not to be put into underground cells. They're supposed to be above ground where you can have a window and a light. Um, but in secret prisons, people are put in 1.5 meter square cells, which also have a, a toilet, a bed, and a sink. That's not very much room. Um, with no window, and they're underground, and they have a very dim light. Um, you won't see another, another person for months at a time if Israel doesn't want you to. Um, because they push the food underneath the door. So you don't even see the person that brings you the food. Um, and, you know, of course, other abuses uh, happen in the interrogating room while you're in a secret prison. So, um, you know, that's just kind of the tail end of this, uh, uh, this lecture. An an another issue in, in prisons, and not just in the secret prisons, was that prisoners aren't allowed any possessions, and they're not allowed to sanitize themselves so that they can pray. Um, and, and that's a, a pretty contentious issue. If you have to wash yourself before you can pray and you're not allowed, um, 
it's, it's too bad, I guess. So uh, I'll try to wrap up pretty quick. Um, the next place I was at was a little village. It's a village of 300 people. Uh, settler, it's a village built completely on one hill. Uh, if you stand back and you look at it, it's a hill, and it's got everything on that little hill, and they own the very fertile land around it. Um, the whole village was settlers built on the mountains surrounding this hill. Uh, they usually on the Sabbath, on Saturdays, um, when they don't work, uh, but also on other days they will come down and terrorize the village. Um, they drove the village out completely. They drove out everybody from this tiny little village of 300 people. Um, not a threat to anybody, but I think the settlers want their, ter their land. Um, and uh, some of them returned with international support. Uh, that group was EAPPI, it's Ecumenical Accompaniment uh, Program for Palestine and Israel. Um, and uh, I had to spend a couple, a couple nights in Yanun because EAPPI had a shift change and they needed some, some internationals to be in the village because there was a Sabbath and that's when the attacks usually happen. Um, and so they needed internationals during, to cover their shift change, uh, which is why they were there. Um, and I just threw in this little snippet. You know, there's, there's some big problems. Like uh, after the settlements went up, the Israeli, the Israeli military declared all the hills going up to the settlements as a closed military zone. And you need permission of the soldiers now to harvest your own crops on those hills. Um, well, what grows on hills? You know, lemon trees and, and, and olive trees and almond trees. And, and those can generate quite a bit of, of income or support your people within your village. Um, five days per year to harvest from the hills around this village. Um, uh, the, the type of things that were reported from Yanun were settlers burning crops. Um, last year, uh, as soon as the wheat crop grew ripe, which is like half the town, half the village's income, uh, the settlers came down, they burned the whole wheat crop, uh, fields and fields and fields of it. Um, they steal livestock, they poison livestock, or they shoot it. I guess a very common way to poison the livestock is you give them pellets that don't, you spread pellets over the ground, but the pellets don't activate until the livestock drinks water. Because, um, you know, if they worked right away, the shepherd would see it and get the rest of the sheep away. But these ones don't activate until uh, they drink water, and so the whole flock has eaten them. Uh, and you go back and you have 200 sets of, of four legs up in the air um, and uh, you have somebody out of work. Um, they kidnap boys. Uh, the settlement that's built around Yanun, and again, Yanun is a 300-person village. There's only 100 now that the settlers drove everybody out. Um, uh, they have these big spotlights that can completely illuminate the village. And you're sitting there at night trying to have a cup of tea or something like that, and they have these giant spotlights. I mean, it's very obnoxious. Um, but they can illuminate the whole village when they're looking for somebody. So if they want, a, if they want somebody from the village, they're going to get them. Um, they'll find them with their spotlights, and then they'll come down with their army. Because, again, the settlers have armies. And every single Israeli citizen, with few exemptions, are part of the military. Um, and so there's not this clear distinction between civilians and military. Uh, you know, um, settlers have their own armies, but most of the settlers are also part of the Israeli army. So they have, uh, you know, training in more than one way. Um, but again, uh, destroying the water source, taking a bath in the water source, um, using the water supply as a bathroom or as a toilet, uh, or adding poison to it is also um, happened, and beating and shooting residents is, is quite common. Um, not just in Yanun. Again, Yanun is up north. This is by Nablus. This isn't even in Hebron. Down in Hebron is where settlers are, are a very big problem, um, much more violent than this. Um, and this is just one tiny little village that you, it's not even a speck on the map. I mean, most maps probably don't have Yanun on it. It's a tiny little village. Um, uh, so what I'm saying is this is the tip of the iceberg. This is, this is um, by far an isolated thing. Um, and there's much worse stories out there. Here's some villages. This is a, or some pictures. This is, uh, if this had a wider shot, you'd see this is all one hill and this village is just built on this one hill. Um, it's a nice little village. It's, it's very small. That's a schoolhouse. They can't fix the roof because Israel won't give them a permit to fix the roof on the schoolhouse so the kids get wet. Um, but that's life, I guess. Uh, and, you know, this is a simple village. Uh, you, you ask yourself why you have a group of settlers driving these villagers out. Um, it's a small village of farmers. They're not doing anything to anybody.
And it's, it's beautiful scenery. This is uh, what you can see when you look out from this village. It's very nice. Um, now, this is uh, one of the villagers' houses. And up top are the settlements. And the settlements go all the way around because it's, it's a hill. And then there's a wraparound higher than that. And the settlement goes all the way around the whole crest of the hill around this entire village. But look at how close they are. Um, you know, like kids, kids don't even get up to go to the bathroom at night because they're scared of the settlers, you know. Like uh, in, in villages that have, have problems with settlers like this village, there's huge incidents of, of like bedwetting and stuff. And not bed, bedwetting while asleep, bedwetting while awake. Because children are so scared of getting out of their beds that they're going to be kidnapped by a, by a, by a settler. Um, it's, it's terror. I mean, you want to ask who the terrorists are. I think that's, a, that's an important question to ask. I'm not going to sit here and tell you who they are, but I think that's a, that's a question to ask. Um, who are the real terrorists? Um, because these settlers sure terrorize this village. Uh, this is on the crest of this hill. Um, these are military outposts built around a 300-person village. What do you need military outposts like this for? Um, these are, these are, this is all the settlement still. right? These are military installations built around a 300-person village. Um, and you see how close they are. Look, they're right, right on top of each other. And, you know, the settlers will attack. Uh, you know, all this green on these hills, the, the, the villages of Yunnan, they're not allowed to harvest any of that um, because the settlers have attacked and the soldiers have declared that closed military buffer zone. Um, you know, it's part of a larger scheme, that's for sure. Anyways, I want to throw a couple of pictures in because Yanun's very beautiful. It's in the Jordan Valley. It's, uh, it's got, you know, one and two thousand three, two thousand year old trees like these trees right here. Um, they're Roma trees. They're from the time of the Roman Empire. They're thousands of years old. I just thought you might like to see them. And this was maybe the most beautiful thing I ever saw. And uh, it's the Jordan Valley. And a picture can't really capture it, but I thought maybe you'd want to see. I didn't have a very good camera, but I still thought those were okay pictures. So. Um, this is the area around, around this tiny little village. Uh, it's, it's a very charming place. Um, also around it is, is the tomb of the father of Joshua. The Sumerians, Sumerians are Arabic, are Arabic Jews. Um, they actually believe that the holy site is, is not, um, not Jerusalem, but uh, here, uh, around the tomb of Nun, because Nun was the father of Joshua. Um, so there's a slight... Uh, just for a bit of trivia. Um, I went on a visit of Janine Camp. Uh, Janine Camp gained notoriety in 2002 uh, when it was totally destroyed by Israeli bulldozers. Um, it's 14,000 people in two square kilometers. That's pretty dense. Um, and it was destroyed in April 2002. Here's a picture from the top of, of the Janine refugee camp. This overlooks part of the camp and also part of the city of Janine. Uh, Janine's way up north, uh, Nablus, which is also fairly, fairly north um, in the West Bank, is kind of the historic site of the freedom fighters, so the Second Intifada. Well, the Israeli military drove the fighters from Nablus north into Janine, and they retreated into the Janine refugee camp. Um, you know, the Israeli army has been repulsed by, by trained soldiers in a number of cases, like 3,000 Hezbollah fighters repulsed the Israeli army in uh, uh, in Lebanon, for example. Um, I think the army is very well trained fighting civilians, but when the Israeli army has to fight fighters, uh, its track record isn't very, very good. Um, it was repulsed at this camp several times. It tried to storm the camp to take these fighters, and it couldn't. The resistance was too strong. So it brought in the D9 bulldozers. The D9s are made by Caterpillar. You want to know a great corporation? That's Caterpillar. Um, Caterpillar makes these D9 bulldozers, which are two stories tall. They're remote controlled. They come standard with grenade launcher mounts and machine gun mounts. Um, and they can withstand a rocket-propelled grenade attack. You can fire an RPG at these things, and when the smoke clears, it'll still be there. Um, so Israel brought in, the, and this is what ran over Rachel Corey, by the way. It was a D9 built by Caterpillar. Uh, and I understand that Rachel Corey's... Um, uh, father bought stock in Caterpillar so that he could go to the, to the Caterpillar me meetings uh, and protest. Um, they bulldozed 365 houses in 12 days in a refugee camp, 
a refugee camp. I mean, what's, what's refugees already, already gone through to be in a refugee camp? They've gone through a lot. Well, here's a little bit more that you have to deal with. Um, killed some 80 civilians. Uh, uh, I think anybody that you talk to in Janine camp uh, knows somebody that was killed. Um, this is a D9 bulldozer. It's quite a monstrosity. It's almost as ugly as the wall that Israel's building. I can't decide which is more ugly. Um, Janine, they got heart, though. They got spirit. I mean, I, I was blown away by this. So what did they do? They built, they built this, this sculpture. It was a German engineer, but, but uh, they built this sculpture out of the ruins of their city. And by the way, I didn't want to include too many pictures, but right here, this scrap of metal right here says ambulance. So uh, you see what was not spared, the bulldoze. Uh, ambulances were bulldozed along with everything else. Um, uh, but, okay, so you're going to smash up our camp. We're going to build some artwork. That's great. You know, this is resistance. This is, this is spirit, you know. Uh, and they, they rebuild a theater. Um, and there's this, this famous theater out of, out of Janine Camp called the Freedom Theater. Um, it's putting out worldwide theatrical productions right now. Um, if you go to Europe, uh, uh, you know, uh, Germany or England or Spain or Italy, you might be able to, to see one of these presentations. Um, only one of the actors of the original theater survived the Second Intifada, and he was a fighter. And he can't... Uh, we actually met him. And he's not allowed to travel because he fought during the Second Intifada, so he has some problems. But um, they had to restart the class, and the first class is now graduating this year after three or four years um, in class. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think this is a very good example of cultural resistance. You know, you, you can beat us down, and, and we're going to get back up. Um, right now, Palestinian leadership has called for a cessation of hostilities. Uh, not that there's, you know, any armaments to use to fight anyways. Uh, Palestinians have rocks. That's about it. Um, but, uh, you know, you lay down your arms and, and you pick up the cultural weapons. And Naomi Klein went on a, on a speaking tour talking about how there needs to be a, a, a boycott of Israel and not just an economic boycott, but a cultural boycott as well. We need to boycott Israeli culture. We need to drive home the shame of what Israel is doing. Um, and, you know, I think acts of cultural resistance are, are, are right in line with that. Um, here's a couple of pictures from the camp. Uh, this camp, you know, it's, it's a very nice place. It's very densely built, but, you know, you can see it's rebuilt. Look, look at all this green, and this camp was completely destroyed in 2002. Um, it just shows you the heart. Uh, so, I'd say i got about 10 minutes left if, if everybody's not falling asleep. Um, this village, Belayin, uh, I was in next. Um, it's a lot like Nailin. It's, it's a province around Ramallah. Um, but it's smaller, and the wall is almost complete there, uh, unlike Nailin. Um, in 2007, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled that the wall going through Belayin was unlawful, that the route that it took was, was, it was unlawful, um, but the decision has yet to be implemented. Um, the villagers of Belayin sued a contractor that's continuing to build the wall along its illegal path, and um, the decision's out now. I, I haven't seen the decision um, but I, the decision was supposed to be out by now, at least. Um, and when I was there, with the decision looming, there was a whole bunch of violence against this village uh, that most thought was, was uh, collective punishment for filing this court case. Um, here's a couple of pictures of Belayin. I was in Belayin mostly at nighttime because this village was being raided every other night by soldiers. And so we were patrolling the streets to try to give a warning call. Um, you know, you can't really get in the way of, of 100 soldiers when they want to come take somebody. But you can at least sound the alarm. Uh, one if by land, two if by sea or whatever. Um, but here's a couple of pictures I got during the daytime when I was there during the day. Um, they've had terrible problems with night raids. Between 29 June and, and the 3rd of August, Israel raided the village uh, every night or every other night and kidnapped 25 boys during that time. I think a lot of these invasions are training exercises. Um, training Israeli soldiers how to do a night raid. Um, but nonetheless, what they do is they torture these boys. Um, you know, some, some people that I was with went to the, the court trials and they saw these boys in court. 
and they were just, you know, beat uh, with words that I don't want to even use, but they were beaten very badly. Um, you know, it was obvious to the judge how badly they were beaten. It was obvious, you know, uh, to everybody. But nevertheless, their, their confession is taken, you know. And that, and that says something about, about a justice system. When you can bring in someone who has obviously been tortured, and it's obvious to the judge that this person's been tortured, and you can nevertheless slap a confession in front of the judge, stained with the prisoner's own blood, and uh, have that confession be accepted as legitimate, that happens here. Anyways, they coerce confessions out of these boys. One, that they throw stones, and two, that the village leaders tell them to do so. And then they use that to arrest the village leaders. You see what's going on here. Um, this is not simple harassment. It's, it's a coordinated plan to shut down a village. Um, so here's a couple of pictures from a demonstration uh, that I was at there. It's pretty cool. Uh, here's the gate that they were trying to, trying to break. They got it open. Uh, they got it open because the Israeli soldiers tear gassed themselves by accident, and they were able to take advantage of that. <laughs> that it's been known to happen. Uh, you know, it's a compulsory military service, and a lot of the soldiers are 18, 19, 20 years old. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're just as nervous as, as a lot of the demonstrators are. Um, you can see it in their eyes. Um, and they will make mistakes sometimes. So anyways, you know, here they're marching. Uh, if you see this shape in the background, that's the, the tent. That's the military's tent that they have set up. So like when the soldiers gas themselves, for instance, they retreated into that tent to, to cough for a while um, and they, to maybe smell something. Uh, so anyways, here's uh, everybody getting up by the fence. Some Palestinians are going to start trying to cut the fence. Um, I don't know if I got pictures. I took pictures of this. This was interesting. Uh, an ambulance drives up to the front. The ambulance, and I was, I was right next to it. I got driven back because they fired a 32 round of tear gas, which is where they fire 32 tear gas canisters at once. And more than the gas, you have to worry about your head getting smashed in by one of them. And so you run away. Um, but I was up by this ambulance when they started firing this tear gas. The ambulance driver opened the door, um, and uh, they fired a tear gas right at the, right at the door of the, the ambulance driver. Um, and then they fired a 32 round of tear gas, uh, basically right at the ambulance um, and right over top of it. And the ambulance had to retreat. So you look at how medical personnel are treated. Um, this ambulance was trying to be in position in case Israel shot somebody uh, to help out. And they drove, they drove the ambulance back by, by firing directly at the ambulance driver. Um, just a picture. I guess that's a lot of tear gas. Um, there's the ambulance being pushed back. Um, you know, there's some kids that want to throw stones. Uh, they actually hit one of my friends. The wind was blowing away from the, the wall so, uh, uh, that day, so one of my friends was just leaning on the wall because all the gas Israel was firing, was, was the wind was blowing it the other way. So one of my friends was just leaning there, and one of these kids actually hit her with a stone by accident. But, um, but uh, you know, um, they got the wall open after, you know, there's still soldiers here, uh, and there's a Palestinian who's uh, uh, engaging them in conversation. Um, while they're opening this gate, then you see the soldiers are gone. That's, that's because they had just tear gassed themselves. Um, and uh, and uh, we had a, a short moment of victory. Uh, you know, one, one meter on, on uh, the other side of the wall. And a, a funny thing about the wall is, look, this is a security wall, according to Israel. A security wall. Well, in my mind, a security wall would separate Israeli land from Palestinian land. But by and large, this wall separates Palestinian land from Palestinian land. And ask yourselves, how does it have anything to do with the security of Israel to segregate Palestine from Palestine? It's an interesting question. Um, and that's here. Both sides of this wall are Palestinian. Both sides. Um, then I was back in Nileen. This was the last demonstration I was at. They actually fired live ammunition at us in this demonstration. I was a little upset about that. Um, it was a small demonstration. They normally demonstrate on Fridays, which is a day off. Um, they held this demonstration uh, during the week because they wanted to start demonstrating twice per day. Uh, but a lot of people couldn't make it. Um, so it was a little smaller here. Just a couple pictures. Cut a decent amount of razor wire. Uh, 
before massive amounts of tear gas drove us back. Um, kids gathered a lot of rocks, but the soldiers uh, didn't drive down that road, so they didn't get a chance to throw them, uh, by and large. Um, but here's the, the force we faced. They, um, now, Eileen's a difficult place to protest because uh, it's real spread out. It's like a, a giant rectangle, and then the soldiers are up that way, so they can fire tear gas that will send you going a whole lot of different directions. And since it's so wide, they can literally take one, and they're pretty, they, they know what they're doing, they're trained soldiers. Um, uh, you know, they can take one group and, and make it 16 different groups, uh, go in 16 different directions. And, and, and when you have a big area like that, they're pretty effective. And that's what happened there. We got dispersed uh, fairly easily. They didn't, they didn't want to toy with us that day at all, and, and uh, that demonstration didn't last too long. Here's some resources if you want to, uh, you know, uh, check out some more about the situation. Um, the first one is the ISM website. Uh, the second one is a very good news source about Palestine, and only about Palestine. Um, man, news. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was a good news service. I followed it a lot more when I was over there, um, I have to say, than I do now, but... Um, uh, you'll get some great reports, and you can break it down area by area. Um, Palestine Monitor has a very interesting fact book that you can get online. Uh, it used to be available as a book, but now I think just as a PDF file. Um, but, but they keep very interesting statistics, uh, like the statistic that 70 women have given childbirth at checkpoints. Um, and they also have some interesting s statistics about the, the mental health of those people after that, that type of a traumatic event. Um, Stop the Wall, it's another organization. PSP, Palestinians, or Palestine Solidarity Project. Uh, uh, they work, they're a lot like ISM, I suppose. They work just in Hebron, though. And Hebron is where uh, the settlers are most ideological, um, which means most violent towards Palestinians. Uh, very, very, very bad settler violence around Hebron. And Palestine... Palestine Solidarity Project is, is based exclusively around there. Um, so they'd be interesting to check out for news about, about the Hebron area, which is, is south in the West Bank. Um, EAPPI, I just know about them because they were in that little village, Yanun, in the Jordan Valley. Um, they're uh, sponsored by the World Council of Churches. It stands for Ecumenical Accompaniment Program for Palestine and Israel. They will actually pay for you to go to Palestine, um, but they uh, won't let you really do very much. You're not allowed to go to direct actions. Um, you're only allowed to document. And so EAPPI, um, well, they, they only document things. So uh, if you're okay with, um, you know, watching a group of settlers, you know, burn down a whole village and just taking pictures and not doing anything about it, that's a good organization to join. Um, and they will pay for you to go there, by the way. Um, and then, you know, Al Jazeera, I, they don't have a specific Palestine page, but they have interesting news updates and they have interesting TV programs um, about the situation. They actually did a 30-minute thing on Sheikh Jarrah, uh, uh, which is, is interesting. You might want to check out. So those are some resources. Uh, there's a lot more out there, but those are some that I know personally. And um, that's it. <laughs> First questioner asks, what was your port of entry into Palestine, and did you have any trouble dealing with customs or other authorities? I entered through Tel Aviv airport. Um, I did not have any problems. Uh, I was quite lucky. Um, I came in at like 3 a.m., and I think uh, maybe I had it easy because it was, it was 3 a.m., but also uh, there was a gentleman with his wife and child ahead of me when I came into the airport, I was detained at the airport. Um, uh, and uh, I was pulled into an interrogation room. But there was a gentleman ahead of me with his wife and child uh, who was having uh, thrown a fit, basically, and slamming his fists on the table because he had been denied entry. And I, th I think that uh, they had to deal with him, and so they just let me pass without questions. So I got in without questions, and uh, they did the same thing when I left. They put me in an interrogation room for 45 minutes, 
And then they gave me my passport and said I could pass without asking me any questions. Um, uh, so I was fairly lucky. Uh, if you do go to Palestine, you have to be prepared for the airport. Um, they will uh, uh, ask you a, a barrage of questions that, that you need to be prepared for. Um, well, it, it depends. I mean, it, it kind of depends, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, it depends, I guess, on why you're going to into Israel. But if you're going into Israel in order to uh, support Palestinian resistance, uh, you have to have a, a story for the airport. That's for sure. When you leave the country, if you tell them that you've been to the West Bank, you will automatically be detained and you will automatically be questioned. So when you leave, um, you have to play the game as well, you know. Um, so, yeah, the airport's very intimidating um, and it's, it's quite a big deal. Uh, yeah. It's not easy to get in and out of Israel. One of the girls we were there with changed her name to get in a second time. Actually. The second question is, the Nilin demonstration seemed to be mostly men. Is that typical? And if so, where are the women? I'm probably not the best person to answer that, but, but it's true. It's, it's a cultural thing. Um, in uh, Muslim culture and Arabic culture, there's a, a, a much greater separation of the sexes than we're used to here in America. Um, and, uh, you know, the Palestinian girls, they want to they wanna demonstrate and they want to throw stones like the Palestinian boys do, um, but they're not allowed. Uh, I'm not the best person to be speaking about Arabic culture. I was only in, in Arabic lands for five weeks. Um, but that's the, sh the short answer is yes, there is a difference. Um, there's a greater separation of sexes uh, in, the, in, in Muslim and Arabic countries uh, than we're used to. And I, I don't necessarily... Um, it's, hard, it's hard to come from a Western country and, and try to pass judgment on that because there's a lot that's different. Um, uh, I'm sorry? Um. We need to confine uh, you have a remarks question. And You're welcome to ask those questions uh, that are written. Yeah, we have a. It's a controversial issue. We have to we have to handle this in kind of an awkward way, and at the cost of some spontaneity. But uh, we ask you to bear with us here. But in any event, my my experience was that um, was that one. There's a, a greater separation between men and women in Palestine. Um, but I also think there's a greater respect between the sexes uh, than there is here. And that's why I say it's, it's difficult to just, to just uh, you know, hear about it and then say, oh, that's wrong, that's oppression of women or something without um, learning more about the culture. So I would, I would defer that question to somebody who knows more about um, Muslim and Arabic culture. Uh, but it's a very good question. Um, uh, this question, it's lengthy, but I'll just summarize it. Uh, it says at the beginning of the Intif Second Intifada, there was no security barrier, uh, and Israel was attacked by suicide bombers. Um, suicide bombing has basically come to an end, and that has not only saved Israeli lives, but also reduced the amount of Israeli military activity in Palestinian areas. While there can be disagreements, reasonable disagreements about the location of the barrier, um, do you think it would be better for both sides if we went back to suicide attacks and reprisals? Um, I'm sorry, but you know that that type of a loaded policy question. That's that's really beyond what the point of this talk was about. This talk was about to talk about what I saw in five weeks in Palestine. Um, and I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not going to be drawn off on some, on some uh, broad policy debate. So um, respect for the question asker, but I respectfully decline to answer that question. Uh, the next question is, how active is the peace movement among Israelis? Well, the experience I would have would be the Israeli anarchists against the wall who demonstrated alongside with us. Um, I wasn't in Israel proper very much. I spent some 
very enjoyable days on, on the Tel Aviv beaches. Uh, but aside from that, uh, uh, I enjoyed working with the Israeli anarchists against the wall, but, but I don't know about the peace movement within Israel proper as such. I, I'm not really in a place to answer that question. The prison which is dedicated to torture, do you know where it is, and do they also send children there? Uh, I mean, it's my understanding that, that torture is a fairly widespread practice uh, when it comes to Palestinian detainees. Um, uh, Israeli law treats Palestinian detainees differently from Israeli detainees. Um, and uh, there's not just one prison that's... I, I, I wouldn't say there's one prison dedicated to torture. I'd say that torture and, and coerced confessions are, are uh, a common technique used in, in most arrest of, of Palestinian persons. Um, is Israel now displacing Bedouins? Um, th there is an issue involving Bedouins. Um, I don't know a lot about it because the thing about Bedouins is, is they move around all the time. Um, Bedouins are, are uh, people who don't live in any set location. Um, they live by tents. They have winter tents and summer tents and they move around and, um, and so on and so forth. So I didn't live with any Bedouins. There's a couple of villages where former Bedouins had settled down and they're being driven out of the places where they had settled down. Um, but that's a bit outside my area of expertise. It's a very interesting issue. Um, and I, I definitely suggest that you look into the issue of Bedouins in Palestine because they are there and, and there are cert, uh, particular, particular issues that affect them. Um, I'm just not knowledgeable on that subject. Um. This person um, asks, uh, in effect, I'm sort of paraphrasing, um, is what you saw comparable to what happened to Native Americans or any society um, when uh, a set of persons is, is being colonized by a strange culture? I've definitely heard the analogy of the plight of Palestinians to the plight of, of American uh, Indians. Um, I'm not quite sure how comparable it is, but I, I think it's a, a nice analogy. I think Algiers, France is another nice analogy. Um, that's kind of a success story, I think, for Palestinians is, is, is uh, the Algiers struggle against French colonialization or the Vietnamese struggle against American colonialization. I mean, you remember, America did not, did not win in Vietnam. Um, they were repulsed by a people's army. Uh, now, Palestine's different from, as far as uh, the Native American situation, I don't know. That's, that's a tough question. I think there's definitely common links. I'm not an expert on, on, on the destruction of the Native Americans, but um, uh, it is a people who've lived in one, one land uh, suddenly getting new neighbors who drive them out of that land. So there's definitely commonalities. Uh, didn't Obama agree last spring that Jerusalem was the undivided capital of Israel? After this, do Palestinians have any hope that the U.S. will ever be even-handed towards both sides in, in the conflict? I don't know if Obama said that. When I was in Palestine, that's, I hope he didn't say that. Um, that's unfortunate. Although that's in keeping with U.S. policy, you know, the U.S., Israel, and Micronesia are about the only three states in the world that, that uh, um, you know, support Israel or Israel's current borders. And by the way, Israel will never tell you what their borders are. Try to find anywhere where Israel says, these are our borders. Israel does not. If you have a question, if you have a question, you're, you're welcome to submit it. Um, yeah, we could bring you a card. Um, uh, you know, Israel doesn't define its borders. Uh, when Israel has all the territory that it wants, then it will say, these are our borders. But you won't find any statements of policy by, by the Israeli government saying, well, here's our borders inside Palestine. Here's our, uh, you know, the, the limits. Um, you just won't find it. Do you have a sense about whether Palestinians are becoming less secular and more fundamentalist? It's my impression that Palestine is fairly liberal in relation to other 
Muslim countries. Um, that's just what I heard. I'm not, I'm not Muslim. Uh, and I was there for five weeks. So I'm not sure. Um, it kind of varies village to village. Some villages, people are very religious. And you can tell by the way they dress. Um, some villages, people are, are very religious and some aren't. Um, but I wouldn't call anybody that I met an extremist <laughs> uh, the way that America would like to paint the picture. Did you hear, this is a reference to a very controversial issue, did you hear Palestinians speak about their young men being kidnapped for the purpose of organ theft harvesting by Israeli soldiers? I did. It was actually broken by a Swedish news organization. I have several friends in Sweden, several very close uh, friends who are activists from Sweden. And in relation to the question about the airports, Swedes are having a very difficult time in Israeli airports right now because there's a lot of Swedish activists, uh, partly because the economy in Sweden is very good and it's... it's easy to travel, but um, I know that the Swedish government has stood behind this journalist, um, and uh, I think that what the journalist asked for is an investigation. The journalist didn't say this has happened, but the journalist said there's enough indications that this might have happened that we need to look closer. And so I think if what Israel's claim is true, if, if, if Israel's right, that this hasn't happened, and I don't know whether it's happened or not, but if, as Israel says, there has been no harvesting of organs uh, from killed Palestinians, then I don't see why it would be fighting so hard uh, against... Uh, okay, thank you. Goodbye. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't... I don't see any reason not to have a further investigation. The next question uh, concerns uh, Gilad Shalit. Do you think Gilad Shalit is being treated according to international law, and will you condemn his treatment? Um, last I knew, he was still in prison, so I don't think that uh, the conditions of his, of his imprisonment can be verified. Um, Although I heard he had been transferred to Egypt to be held in security, and, and maybe Egypt can, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, that's that's a really big issue. That was a really big issue when I was in Palestine. Was the release of of, of that prisoner? Um, if you don't know, this is an Israeli soldier who was captured uh, uh, by uh, Gaza Palestinian forces in Gaza. Um, uh, as far as his treatment goes. Um, I'll be interested to find out. I hope he's being treated well. He deserves to be treated well. Um, one thing I will be curious about is whether his treatment changed during Israel's incursion in Gaza. Because uh, Shalit, if I pronounce his name correctly, was being held, as I understand, in a prison in Gaza. And Gaza was, was you know, having 10,000 pound bombs dropped on people's houses um, just earlier this year. So whether, you know, whether this vast military operation in Gaza... Uh, threatened the way that he was treated. It, it may have, you know, maybe a bomb fell on his bunker. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, there's all kinds of rumors that negotiations about his release are imminent, and then Netanyahu will say, well, no, there's no negotiations that I've heard of, and uh, it's back and forth. So I don't know. Until until he's out, I don't think that we'll know, to be honest. I I hope that he's being being treated uh, uh, according to international standards, and I believe that he, he deserves that. It says uh, Israel, basically Israel withdrew from Gaza, uh, ethnically cleansing Gaza of all Jews uh, in 2005. Since then, Israeli towns have been subject to regular volleys of rockets. Um, in response, Israel launched unprecedented military operations in 2006 and 2009. Doesn't that experience and the suffering that resulted on both sides show that Israeli withdrawal should only happen in coordination with the Palestinian Authority and as part of the a comprehensive peace agreement? Um, that's a, uh, one of those broad policy questions that, you know, it's not really the purpose of this talk to answer, but let me just tell you something about the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority are lapdogs to Israel. They do not represent Palestinian interests. Um, you know, Hamas was a democratically elected government, and Palestinian authorities have been arresting Hamas members whenever they can get their hands on them. 
So when you hear in cooperation with the Palestinian Authority, you should know Palestinian Authority is not loyal to Palestinian people. Palestinian Authority is loyal to Israel. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a very broad question calling for some public policy judgments, and, and that's really just beyond the scope of what I think we can talk about today. Okay. I would like to say, do not trust the Palestinian Authority, though. Okay, the final question then. ISM supports nonviolent means of protest. Does it also engage in anti-violence education among Palestinian communities in order to bolster the moral position that violence is wrong? Well, ISM is a, a nonviolent organization. We don't support violent actions. So um, I guess I'm not quite sure where the base of that question comes from. Um, we don't associate with persons. Yeah. Oh. Check it out. I mean, a couple of years ago, they used to have issues, uh, especially around Nablus, with fighters showing up to demonstrations, you know, former freedom fighters with their guns and stuff. Um, it was always ISM's policy to leave when, when guns came out. Um, I don't think that that's been an issue among among demonstrations for at least two years now. Um, but uh, I don't know. You know, some, some people will criticize ISM because they'll stand next to kids who throw stones. Um, and, you know, the position is, one, well, stone throwing at armored personnel and armored vehicles isn't that violent. It's more like symbolic resistance. It's more like throwing the, the paint, you know, the paint on the tank to say, I got you. Um, but, you know, the second answer is, well, even, even if you think throwing a stone is violent, I mean, if I got hit in the face with a stone, I'd think it was violent. Um, but again, I'm not a soldier wearing body armor behind a tank uh, with an M16. Um, but the second answer is, well, look, uh, if internationals are there, the, uh, the Israelis have to use less violent means to disperse the, the crowd. Um, and so it actually de-escalates the situation to have international stand by the stone throwers. That's, that's the main contention that people will, will pick about ISM's nonviolence principle. Now, nobody in ISM throws stones. Uh, nobody in ISM gives, gives people stones to throw. Nobody makes slings for the boys. Uh, um, and in response to the earlier question, I've heard, you know, the girls want to throw stones too, but uh, it's a culture. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, um, but but uh, you know it's got the organization pretty much has its hands full with kind of what it's doing. I'm I'm not aware of any um, uh, like nonviolence training or something. And, and plus, that would kind of go against the principle that it's a it's a Palestinian-led organization. I mean, the, the bedrock of ISM is that is that it's not a group of internationals that go into Palestine and say, Palestinians, you who are under this illegal military occupation, let us tell you how to resist this unlawful occupation. It's no, look, you're the ones under this illegal military occupation. You resist. And we're there to support you, but you tell us what you want from us. Um, and, and so, no, we definitely it's not an organization that will tell Palestinians how to protest. You know, um, under international law, Palestinians are fully within their rights to use violence uh, to resist an unlawful uh, military occupation. They're not doing that right now. They're peacefully resisting at the moment. Um, the second intifada is over. But, um, but uh, yeah, no, we're, we're Palestinian-led, uh, and only to the extent that the Palestinian-led actions remain nonviolent, and at which point we leave. Okay, thank you very much, Lieutenant.